Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for the uh, latter half of day two of IROC. Uh, please join me in welcoming our very next panel, the Progressive Indigenous Business Relationships Panel. This one is sponsored generously by Mosaic Forest Management. I'd also just like to remind everybody before we get started that we're going to be using Slido once again as our live question and answer tool. So please use the QR code, send in the questions, and uh, our wonderful moderator, Dallas Smith, will be happy to share those questions with our panelists. So without further ado, I will uh, pass it over to Dallas to introduce Gabby Wickstrom, Gary Wilson, and Kevin Jules. Thanks so much, Logan. I really appreciate you stepping in and helping out. And we just had a little bit of laugh. He's like, are we already starting about one minute? And I said, yeah. And then I walked out the door. And he found me. And we're here. What a great day so far. This is not only awesome because we have so many great stories to tell, but the ability to share the stage with some people I've grown up with professionally over the years and even some of that beforehand is just something that's very special to me as an individual and I just really appreciate all the panelists who've been able to give their time to share some of their stories but here we are going on with the next one business partnerships this again is something that we've all kind of had to learn by doing We've seen some great success stories, but we've seen some absolute train wrecks. I've been the conductor of a few of those train wrecks myself. But you live, you learn, you re-strategize, and you keep going forward because our communities deserve better than, sorry, we couldn't figure it out. Sorry, there is too many obstacles that got in our way that prohibited us from achieving this goal that we know will put our communities in better places to live. So I want to thank the panelists for being here and maybe give them two, three minutes each to give a bit of an intro of who they are, who, what they're working with, and then we'll get into a nice discussion. And some of you who I've known for a while, I might share a story or an anecdote with, and some of you, yeah, I'm looking at you, Gary. I'm looking at you. But some of us have made it out of the skiff, and we're at the steering wheel now, and I think that's an important journey and evolution that people who come to events like this need to understand how we've sort of grown that capacity and kind of grown up figuring some of these things out. So without any further ado, I'd like to start with, I think I'm going to go right off script, and I'll start on the far side and go with my dear friend, Gabby Wickstrom. Thank you, Dallas. Um, it's Gayla Kesla, Nuguam Gabby Wickstrom. I am the general manager for the Namgis Business Development Corporation, and that is on the traditional territory of the Kwakwakiwak. Uh, a little bit about my background, some of you may um, know. I, I came out of politics a little, that's where Dallas and I um, <clears throat> knew each other. I was a counselor for six years, mayor for four years. Prior to that, I owned a driving school. Um, and I've got this weird, eclectic mix, a little bit of background, kind of odd, but I feel it's perfectly suited for where I find myself today. Um, I have a mentor's heart, so in my opinion, um, when I first got this position, I said my job is to mentor myself out of a job. And uh, we talked a little bit about capacity and uh, developing that capacity, and that's really my heart. Um, I also have some board experiences, so it just puts me in a unique position um, in this particular organization that I find myself in. Thank you. Gary? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yo, Ipmas, Wilmax, Mawaktus, Takanyala Stilkatle. My I just want to pay homage to our ancestors, our elders, our ladies of high rank, our chiefs, our children, those yet to be born. My traditional name is Ganis Lagalis. I'm a citizen from the, citizen from the Heistiok Nation community of Bella Bella on the Central Coast. And as you can see from my headshot there, the camera guy did a pretty good job, actually. I look, I look a few years younger there. Uh, 
Uh, I'm the CEO and Director of Economic Development for the Teach My Enterprises, which is a wholly owned enterprise of the Kayika Checklist at First Nation. Uh, those of you who don't know, they're the northernmost Nechalnoth community on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and their, prop, their territory is south adjacent to Quatsino, First Nation, a uh, beautiful part of the world, um, and, I'm, and a, a treaty nation. And I'm proud to provide support, technical support, facilitation of economic development and enterprise in the territory and outside of the territory. Uh, I like to think of myself as a fisherman on sabbatical. Uh, as Dallas pointed out, I was a skip man, a shore man, a deck I did everything. Other than being a skipper, uh, my dad didn't trust me at the wheel. Uh, but uh, and, and it, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, I, I like to think of myself as being in the background. Uh, if I'm representing another nation in terms of its economic development or some other facet uh, I think I can only speak with and alongside uh, with folks who are from the community, but I can't speak for, and that's how I've been taught. So in cases of you know, community engagement, whether it's in community or outside, I normally like to stand in the background and allow citizens and leaders and community to do the work, because really their heart, their mind, their history, their knowledge, uh, they have, I don't. And I'll say one thing. I remember walking into the, uh, the office uh, for the first time on November 1st of 2021, and there was uh, the chief, Francis Dillette, introduced himself. He's a Czechoslovak nation uh, hereditary chief. And he said to me, I'm just an old guy. Someday I'll have to step aside for the young folks to take over. And I said, no. I could have all the Ivy League degrees in the world but you have a PhD in Kayuka Chaklis and knowledge. And I need you more than you need me, because I want to understand where you come from, your history, your land, your people, your language. And without that, I won't be able to do my job well. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Never had a chance at the wheel? Or your dad was a now, skipper. Now and then, my dad needed to, needed to get some sleep. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I always and, had and there to was do a lot, There was lots of water. There was <laughs> no land in sight. <laughs> I used to pilot that same strip when I got my chance at the wheel, so it's nice that we could meet here on this stage many years later, brother. Um, Kevin Jules, introduce us. Hello, hello. You guys hear me okay? My name is Kevin Jules. I come from the Cayuca Checklist at First Nation. Um, I get to, uh, I'm lucky enough to share the bloodline with both of our nations from Cayucat and Chaklisit. So it, it's an honor to, uh, to be here today. Um, yeah, and it, it's just amazing because I started out this process in uh, the political realm. We're a treaty nation. And back in uh, 2011, when our treaty uh, first started, I was, I was nominated for, um, to, for our leadership. And uh, I won. I was I was surprised. I wasn't even. I was a teen, uh, a teacher's assistant for kindergarten, and also from grade one to grade twelve, where we had uh, probably like forty students for, um, within grade one to twelve. So it was uh, it was it was definitely a, a whole new pair of shoes to put on. But it was my grandmother who who talked me into it. My late grandmother Patricia Nikolai from the Checklist at First Nations, and she it was her that instilled it in me. You know I. I didn't see it in me, but it took someone to tell me like that, you know, I have I have a powerful voice. You know, when I speak, people listen. When I when I'm up there talking about our nation or speaking for a nation, you know, I hold a lot of heart and I put a lot of heart into what I say. And she's seen that in me. So um, so to honor her, I said, Okay, I'll run. If I win, I win. If I don't, I don't. I didn't do any campaigning, I didn't do anything. And then sure enough, I won. I was like, oh. Wow, now what? Okay, now, now, now we're all, we're a brand new treaty nation. So it was, it was something, it was a whole new pair of shoes to put on. And, and I, I got, I ran for three terms. So I was in there for 12 years. So um, I had a, a pretty big, pretty big impact on, on our nation. And my, my main goal was, you know, speaking for our future generations, because, you know, those are the people that you know, we're, we're gonna have to leave all of this behind too. Those are the people that are gonna come in and take over. And, and um, 
and flourish and and with what we leave behind is what would we'll, what they'll have to work with so that's something that's the that's how I went into it you know thinking about our, our future generations and um, just being a part of that and and I, I got to be the vice chief of our nation so I got to hold the the government to government conversations I got to go to Ottawa and you know um, I had a great mentor in in Frank Dragon who is uh, who, who an amazing person plus our, our uh, CAO Cynthia Blackstone um, she is someone who I inspire who really inspired me because she's someone who is from our nation who moved away but came back to our nation when when we needed someone the most and she was that person and just to see how much our nation has grown since she has been back how much our our office has grown into departments now we have fisheries departments we have education departments lands and resources departments a lot of stuff that would have that would have fell on the CAO's shoulder she was able to delegate and 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 also uh, bringing in Gary. Um, Gary, and so much has grown since he's come into Teachma. Uh, Teachma is our, our group of businesses that, uh, for, that we manage for our nation. And uh, Gary started out with uh, what, two, three people within the office. And now there's, I can't even count, 30, almost 30, 30 people now. It, it seems like every other week I'm seeing a congratulations to, to t Teachma. Someone, someone new is starting or within our office of KCFN, the exact same thing. So it's, it's amazing. So going to hold these government to government relationships and, and being mentored by Frank Dragon, who's been in the political realm for, wow, I, he says how old he is, but in political years, whoo, he is <laughs> up there. <laughs> but it's, it was, it's amazing to learn from because, you know, he taught me that our days of, of, uh, of pounding the table were over, you know, those were the days of, uh, of that my uncle held, that my grandfather held, you know, of getting the government to listen. You had to pound the tables. So now it, now I got the opportunity to be there and speak, but not speak being above the government and not being below the government, but being eye to eye and working and working together on the problems because there was a word being thrown around called reconciliation. So I got to be the guy who went up there and said, it's in all of your mandates. What is, what's reconciliation if you don't have any action behind it? So it's in your mandates, but you're, what, what are you doing about it? So that was, that was one of my big goals of being, uh, being there is to, you know, we want to see some action behind this, uh, behind this word. Now we have economic reconciliation. And then there's, there's so many different variations of reconciliation because you, you can't just go in there and reconcile and be like, okay, you know, are you good? I'm good. We're good. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. You know, we have to, we have to work together. We have to understand and a lot of it is understanding our past and, and, the, and the things that we had to go through as my grandparents had to go through, dealing with residential school and being a survivor and, then, and, and me not knowing the stories or under, understanding why I didn't know the stories, but then growing up to understand that you know, generational trauma is a real thing and, and, and seeing that she didn't want me to have to, under, uh, to uh, to know about that trauma so that I didn't have to live through that trauma or, or be a part of that trauma. And that was huge. And I, I didn't know about it until her last years uh, on this earth that, you know, the, the kind, of, kind of traumas that she went through with residential school. And I, I took that in as, as something that, you know, she's one of the strongest women I've ever met in my life. My mother passed away when I was 16. So my grandmother raised me, she raised all of us. I came with uh, four other siblings, and um, and yeah, that's that's a little bit of me. Thank you. You know, I think that's something that needs to be put into perspective that each of the panelists talked about was the ruralness of the communities that we come from. I go to the big. Oh, I used to go to the big conferences. Now I only go to the part that I speak at. But this is the one of the few that I go to all day, well, except when I get away from Logan. But um, you know, people don't comprehend, and I don't want to use the word challenges, but it's not as simple just to put together an economic development program in a rural First Nations community. Because you're not drawing from the same investor pool, you're not drawing from the same capacity. You're talking to someone who carries three different titles within an office, because that's what the community needs. The community needs 
people who can deliver all these different programs and opportunities, and you find it's the same kind of four or five, half a dozen people, glad to hear there's more. Each of us are growing more capacities, and um, I think that's something that gets taken for granted is just a little bit more of the relationship building that is so important in rural communities because anytime something has changed in a rural community, it was never usually for the better. Government showed up and took our children. If that wasn't enough, they took our language. And then to come back 30, 40, 50 years later and use us as a reason for being a drain on the society is complete bullshit. And we've seen over the last couple of years how various segments of urban, or sorry, of rural communities have just sort of said, you know what? We're tired of waiting for someone to figure it out for us. We're going to figure some of these things out and we're going to bring a game plan forward. And we've seen it up and down Vancouver Island. We've seen it up to your homelands in the Haytook Territory. We've seen the Nishkas. We've seen everybody, the Taltan. We've seen everybody start to take their rightful place. And that's one of the great things is we're able to sort of show a bit of a roadmap on what it took to get us there. Gabby, you were talking about the driving school. I was having a bit of a joke with Corey. My, my first job when I worked for our treaty society was I was Bill Wilson's driver until they realized I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> but just how integral, whether you're rural, urban, driving is just something that urban kids take for Granted, you turn 16, you get your learner's permit, you know, you drive your mom or dad crazy, whoever, for that 30 days. Well, now I believe it's a year long. But you just, it's something you do. It's, it's not even a rite of passage. It's just a given. But in First Nations communities, the ability to get proper driver's training and be able to actually operate a vehicle, be insured, has been so limiting. And so to see the work that you guys are doing around the driving school, give me some of your thoughts on just you know, how important a driver's license is to any employment. First, I want to say it's called um, innovative partnerships, but really when you talk about rural communities, it's common sense partnerships. It's the way smaller communities have always done things. We've always figured it out. It's We're not waiting for somebody to come and fix a problem. We go to our neighbors and we, we try to, to remedy the situation the best that we can. So. I, I found it interesting. I thought innovative, how innovative. Anyway, it's more common sense, really. So the driving school, um, when you talk about partnerships, well, first of all, to back up, I was asked um, to b do a business plan for the driving school. I tried to sell my driving school, and I just couldn't, and I laid it down. And I knew what a void it would leave in the community. I knew what opportunities it presented for. I worked with many Indigenous nations, and, and just to... I mean, I was just thinking employment. I wasn't thinking um, getting to the doctor's appointment down island. I wasn't thinking going to a beach that the bus doesn't take you to and what that meant to a young mom who could take her children there and experience that, you know, without relying on somebody else. And so I was asked to write this business plan, which is kind of hilarious because when I started my driving school, I didn't, I just started charging things and paying for things and I never had a business plan. But the board of NBDC approached me and said, would you write one? And I said, sure. So I couldn't even scab off my own business plan. I had to, I actually had to work at it. But I did um, link the nation up with, or the DevCorp up with a woman, some of you might know her, Lucy Sager. Um, she has a paper called The Road to Reconciliation, which she wrote for the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And um, gosh, that's a whole other story on itself, how we've become friends and how her tireless advocacy for creating opportunities for nations. Um, so anyway, just to back up, she helped apply for funding. We got funding from Pacific Can. We got funding from Ice-T. When you talk about partnerships, we also had corporate sponsorships. Um, Paper Excellence, Mosaic, uh, Western Forest Products, Orca Sand and Gravel, uh, all recognizing how important it was to the region and what opportunities it would open up. Um, probably the best story about the driving school at this moment right now is we have uh, just hired our last instructor which will allow us to operate full time. And Josie was a driving school student of mine and now she's a driving instructor. 
So, and that kind of cheers me up because I, she's so excited and I see the opportunities. And, um, you know, we, that driving school will never pay a dividend check. It never will. We probably will break even. But the economic benefits that the nation will see, that the communities will see, other nations, we do, we do work with um, Clem too as well. And uh, they send people down on a day rotation and then send them back up and they can save money doing that so that we are in that region is incredible. And just to round off with Lucy, Lucy has advocated, you know, can, <laughs> trying to write the L test in community. It, it, it was like pulling teeth, it was unbelievable. But now ICBC is going into community and they're administering the tests in community. Then there was the hurdle where, okay, people got their L, but they still had to come into the city to get their piece of paper. And now they have mobile kiosks that are coming that can print out that piece of paper. So just one after the other, little barriers, just removing them so that it, it is easier for indigenous nations, especially in remote areas, to acquire a license and then to get training and then be able to have um, a little bit more freedom on the road. You know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the whole, I was thinking about that whole innovation side and the common sense that comes to it, but just some of the investments that we need to make in the community to enable our larger investments to bring the return that we're looking for. And you know, Gary, you and I have probably known each other 25 years now. I don't want to age us because people think we're young, but... We were in kindergarten when we met. Well, yeah, I think so. I might have been there two years, but that's another story altogether. Um, you know, you've been kind of traipsing through the Great Bear Rainforest as I have, and we both played a number of different roles. I mean, what is some of the things you've learned both from your time within your community? I know you spent some time in Coastal First Nations office. I know you spent some time with um, CIBC um, during part of your career. What are some of the things that have helped prepare you to bring some of that knowledge to a rural community, but also help empower them? Like you said about the leader who came to you and said, I'm gonna get out of your way. You know, what are some of the lessons you've learned kind of along that path that have, you know, put you in a position to really help guide as opposed to drag, I guess? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it, they, you know, the, I'd rather be fishing, to be honest with you. I'd rather be on a sane boat still. But the cards, you know, my, my, my uncle and my aunt, my great uncle and aunt would ask, my um, Uncle Vivian and uh, asked me to go out fishing with him. I was working at a marine store in Latin. Her, my, our daughter was very young. And he, he asked me if I could, you know, uh, come out and fish with him. So I said, sure. Fall after that, it was like, now what? I have a young child. And I had a friend of mine. I was going to Kwatlin College University at that time. And he worked at a bank. See, I, he worked at RBC. And he said, there's an opportunity there to learn, uh, understand that industry. Now, I'm a reformed banker. And actually, Cynthia Blackstone, that uh, my friend here uh, mentioned, is also a reform banker. And it's funny, I'm between two reformed politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, so lessons learned for me was really navigating the financial industry, not-for-profit. I'm also in the not-for-profit housing industry as part of my volunteer work. But what I noticed in my travels was key to success for a lot of those organizations other than the bank. And that's why I left the bank, because they're going to do OK without me. Uh, particularly around not-for-profit and First Nations, Indigenous-led organizations is key. Is what's key is partnerships, al mission-aligned partners, partners that understand, respect, and acknowledge, and appreciate a vision and a mission of what it is you're trying to accomplish, and what our role in leaders and technicians, and whatever role we play in community is about, really articulating clearly what the nation vision is the seventh generation principle that we're here for, uh, you know, and, and Len Apedale, our general manager for forestry, non-Indigenous says, yeah, companies will come and go 30 years, 50 years, but Indigenous peoples will be here long before and have been, will be here long after you're gone. The cycles of business, the politicians, uh, all of those folks who come and go into our lives, the nations will always be there, but we want, and what we say to partners is that certainty for us is certainty for you. Mm. You know, the transition of your business as you evolve, 
you, you know, your business can last as long as a relationship, a good relationship, quality relationship with the nations you do business with. And so, yeah, there, there's certainly an opportunity, I think, around reconciliation, economic reconciliation, is to really get to understand, have a lot of patient capital, because trust is an issue, as you, you may or may not know, because they've been duped so many times by so many snake oil salesmen. When you come in the room, um, it's about a relationship. It's about getting to know the people, about understanding who they are, about understanding their history and their culture, and being able to accept the fact that it's going to take some time. You heard Dallas talk about the acquisition that they just had to how many premiers and deputy ministers and on and on, and that's how long it took. So that's really where we're at. You know, we've been, and so the in, in my role as a CEO and director of economic development for a nation that I'm not from, I'm a guest, right? I'm a guest in their territory. I have a lot of respect for those people, for the nation leadership, their hereditary system, the legislative and executive system that they have established. You know the the you know the structures that they've developed. And I had to understand them, get to know them, ask Kevin a lot of questions. Uh, you know, just ask questions, get to understand, don't assume, uh, you know, making sure that whatever it is they are trying to achieve, that you're aligned with that. And that's what I tried to do, try to understand when I showed up on November 1st of 2021, um, post, almost post-COVID, right, uh, I was just getting out of that time, really, I was looking at uh, their ECDEB plan, I helped them support their act, the, develop, the finalization of their ECDEB plan, but going through that process helped me understand what direction they want to go. Really important to get to know that. And it's not a transaction, it's a relationship. The transaction will happen. Be patient on that. Right now we're negotiating a tenure acquisition similar to what Nano Colas had done. Not quite the size and scale, but for the nation it's significant. You know, we had a forestry operation with small tenures that revolved every five years. It didn't generate a lot of revenue on a consistent basis, but when it did, it was helpful. And Len Apedale would come in the office every now and then. But after this transaction, we're going to be able to function year-round. And a lot of the monies and revenues that normally went to Interfor's shareholders, and whether it's in Chicago, Toronto, New York, is now going to be coming back to the community. It's, it's a legacy opportunity for the nation per, in perpetuity for generations as long as they, they welcome that, that kind of business in their territory and so the monies that they make will be derived in, in, you'll see language we talked about restoration revitalization earlier uh, culture all of those monies will be reinvested and this is what we were saying to those folks in the boardrooms the ceo and their vps when we met with them for the first time. You don't understand the importance of this transaction. It's not just a business transaction for this nation, right? It's survival, it's thriving, going from managing poverty to managing prosperity. This is the direction the nation's going. And so that's the role I play, and I'm honored to work beside Kevin and his, his fellow citizens at the nation because it's gonna change lives, as Kevin pointed out, for his son, his grandson, his grandchildren, those future generations are gonna look back at this day when we acquire that tenure. It's not just a business transaction. It's gonna transform the nation that can be sovereign once again. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's, you know, where this whole concept needs to go is around getting away from the transaction. I've been doing this long enough where somebody would sit down beside me and say, hey, we're doing this in this area not even acknowledge that it's in our territory, but what do you think about that? And I'd be like, well, I don't know. Well, let me take you to a hockey game and then I'll ask you what you think about that. And it was always about achieving one goal at a time. And I think that's what First Nations have brought to this discussion. And some companies are getting it sooner than others. I know Western has gotten there. We've had to work together to get there and we're setting a benchmark for other industry giants to follow. I sat in the Great Bear Rainforest and watched, you know, this whole fight over our lands and resources. And then I watched forest companies get compensated and reinvest all that money in North Carolina and Washington State 
and other places while we had to live with the impacts of those decisions. So, you know, Kevin, as you played a political role to help get your nation, a treaty nation, and move those things forward, what's something you see as you sort of, you know, matured's not the word, but have you, as you've grown into, you know, beyond being a politician and trying to make these things work because that's what your community needs. Just some insight on why you're doing what you're doing and making that change from, like you said, you know, we had people behind us who pounded tables really well, but once you get people's attention, you have to have a clear message for them. And that's where leaders like yourself will come in. So just some of your thoughts on that. No, I'm okay, thank you. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know. I've never thought about what do I do if someone did that. I'd just talk longer, but that's okay. No, um, you know, it's, it, it's all about, like, you know, we're, we're uh, within Teachma here, we say we're at the infancy phase. You know, we're, we're, I, think we're, I think we're walking now. I think we're growing to the point where we're walking to where we see, you know, the opportunities growing, to our, our capacity growing. And, you know, it's, like, within me, it was um, about our nations and their, our, our group of businesses. You know, it wasn't, it, you know, making a profit is amazing. You know, it's always good to see a profit. But, you know, like, like um, what Gabby alluded to with, you know, sometimes it's a break-even process. And, you know, the break-even process is sometimes the goal because, you know, the, you, you may not make money out of it, but... Like, like with her, she gained, she gained someone from her program that came back and is now teaching it. And that, that is something that, that you see as like amazing because that's, that's something money can't buy. Um, so uh, coming into this, we have our, our group of businesses. We have our hospitality business where we have um, our fishing lodge. And our fishing lodge is, um, is, uh, is a seasonal business, but it, it, it is a big part of our, our nation because it employs the, I'd say about 90% of, of the people working there are our nation members. So, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. The impact uh, of that alone is huge because um, being, a, being from an isolated and remote community, we're a fly in our boat only community. So you gotta, I'll, I'll give you a little a brief uh, on where we're from, you know, where we have to take a 45 minute boat ride. To, in order to leave, 45 minute boat ride, hour and a half in the car, and on a gravel road, then another hour and a half on the highway, and you're only halfway there. You grocery shop, then you got to do it all, all in reverse. So you know it, it's 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 things like that that you know drive. We had a driver's license program within our community, and you see the impacts it created within the people who, who have never had a driver's license now have this freedom of oh I can go out now and I can go out and shop, and then there's there's people that we had where. You know, we, we have problems with our infrastructure right now where we can't build. We can't, we can't add more housing. We can't, you know, we, we can't even add, uh, like, we can't add anything. We, but um, that didn't stop our nation from wanting to do something. So what we uh, created a program, a carpentry program for our, our nation members. And now they were involved in, in um, working, with, uh, working with the businesses and, and being the lead carpenters on, you know, renovating and bringing our houses up to code because, as you know, First Nations housing is terrible. It's bad. So, and for them to be a part of that solution was just amazing because now they get to say that, you know, I helped, I helped with that house and 50 years down the line when that house is still standing there, their grandchildren can be like, yeah, my grandfather built this house, you know, and, and we have our, our, our business within the businesses with in the um, West Coast Expeditions, who's the kayaking outfit that has been working um, in our nation for the past 20 plus years, probably 25 years, and has been, and it's gone, th it went through about three owners, but they've always been, um, the one thing that they, they knew is that, you know, the local community is who they need to have a relationship with. And they kept that relationship with us. They kept it to the point now where about three years ago, we bought that outfit, we, we took it over. And, and, um, and now we have it, and we have uh, one of our members uh, managing it and being a big, you know, she, she was actually one third owner of it, but, um, and then she, get, she came back in, a, in, another, in another form of, of taking over and being a part of that business. And now, now, now it's just great to see someone from our community coming in and um, be making a huge impact on, on this and uh, 
Yeah, it, it's from, yeah, I'm, I think I'm rambling now, but uh, <laughs> go ahead, my man. No, I, I think you're spitting some knowledge that we all need to hear because as we build innovative businesses and opportunities, they're not because we're worried about a stock price. They're not because we're worried about a return on investment initially up front. This is about investing in our own infrastructure because we're in remote communities where it's very challenging. And so I know one of the reasons why our chiefs task Namakolas with building own source revenue is because we can't wait for government to give it to us. And as they give it to us, there's always a price tag with it. So a lot of us have started to learn to be more, more, more entrepreneurial about this and going to government and saying, okay, we're gonna bring our own, say it's a $12 million housing project. We're gonna bring three million of our own dollars here. So at least match that three million, then we can work with other investors to make those kinds of things happen because we understand the opportunity for infrastructure based on the businesses at hand in our communities. And that's why this panel is so important to this program is because I think of Kittisu, I think of you guys, I think of places where you're not just driving to Overweighty if you need something. Your kid breaks his ankle on the trampoline, you're not just hopping in the car and getting to the hospital. These are things that we need to think about that are going into our business opportunities. And the companies that have been more successful have started to acknowledge that and understand that and not be afraid of it. Before, they're like, well, we don't want to get stuck paying for something government should be paying for. But then they realize the healthier our communities, the healthier their business are going to be, whether they're seasonal or not. But as we're talking about infrastructure, I mean, Gabby, you and I go back a long ways in, you know, Island Coast, the role that you played as Mayor of Port McNeil when we went through some pretty big challenges, both in fishing industry, the aquaculture industry. And I know you and I were talking during the seven month long strike and how it just started to impact our communities. And while, again, stock prices fluctuate a little bit, the level of human well-being in our communities started to drop dramatically because of poor policy changes that were either made in government or corporate headquarters in Toronto. What's some things that you've just learned from all the roles that you've played that just show that need for collaboration? Like, I used to think your predecessor, Mr. Fernie, while he was a mentor of mine, he was a pain in the ass because every time he thought I was gonna get something, it cost him something. And what just from your, you know, from your experience, what have you seen over the last couple of years that have brought this discussion in the right direction? Funny, it's another Fernie that uh, usurped me, so. <laughs> um, I should have said junior or senior. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, Gosh, I was here last year, I, I wrote this down because this was something that really struck me. Someone said, when First Nations prosper, we all prosper, but it's not always the case the other way around. And um, I see such opportunity, and there are some of the nations in the room that are partnering with municipalities and that, but I, I see a lot of potential there because municipalities can access funds that First Nations cannot, and First Nations can access funds that municipalities cannot. We have housing issues. Um, you know, I remember um, former Chief Spandick said to me, I was at the strike actually, and he said, you know, when, when we suffer, you suffer. And when we are looking, like I want I really wanna talk about Guatney because it's a land use planning process that's going on right now. And he said, you know, we, we're not looking to shut everything down. We wanna have a balance between recreation and economic opportunities. And I, having a former political hat on, one of the frustrations when policy comes along is that for municipalities, um, we weren't even a stakeholder. They didn't talk to us. And when I look at this Guatney land use planning process, they went to residents in the Mount Waddington region. They went to um, industry. They, in, uh, municipalities were invited to the table. Uh, First Nations are doing a better job than the government. <laughs> and I, I felt included all along the way. Great communication. It was just, it's just an amazing process and I think there can be more and more of that as we work together to, to meet our housing needs. Um, are there other partnership opportunities? 
Um, and maybe that's something that I can bring to help sort of build that bridge in my region that, that wasn't really there. It is at Port Hardy and the others are doing a good job, but maybe not where we were. Oh, great answers. I see we got Slido up and running now. Um, how can you suggest an organization reach out to indigenous communities and begin building meaningful relationships? I think coming to BCI Rock every year is probably a step in the right direction, but as I said, we're all about selfless promotion here at IROC. But um, Gary, what's something that you can think of? You know, you and I have been around from those days where they reach out to talk to you about an idea, they just kind of want the answer they want to hear from to where actual meaningful engagement starts to place. What are some you know, tips you can give to our audience on meaningful engagement? Yeah, I think, I think um, as I mentioned earlier, just it's not about the transaction, it's about a relationship and if it's meaningful and it's aligned, understanding where th they are, meeting them where they are. Uh, capacity is an issue. Certainly like uh, t Tichma, we have, we're having trouble attracting citizens to work. So we, we invited an, an organization to come in and develop a succession planning you know, uh, program for us because we're trying to find ways to get, help citizens see themselves working within the organization. My role is to put myself out of a job. Mm -hmm. Kevin's gonna be standing in my place or somebody. And my general manager at Forestry says, there's a young, per young girl or a guy, young boy or girl in kindergarten right now that's gonna be an RPF running this forestry business. That's the culture we're gonna bring to this. It's intergenerational, it's multi-generational, it's multifaceted. And when a, when a company is to come in and they want to engage and they want to, if there's an opportunity, if there's a solution to something that you see, for example, one of the challenges we have out there, we have single phase power. If we were to ramp that up to three phase power, you gotta have $60 million in your genes. It's not, it's not an easy fix. Well, what are the alternative solutions in the meantime? Because we're not, we can't go back to the grid. We're not close enough to the main grid to apply any, you know, alternative energy solutions that would generate any revenue. However, we have a partner that is international has come to us and said, uh, he, he's done a good job. His business has done well. He's, he could retire today, but he said, you know, uh, he, what, when we engaged with him, when we told him the story, not only of Kayuka Chekhovsit, but the overall indigenous story, and from our perspective, my perspective, shared some reference material with him. He took the time to review it, took the time to get to know us, to understand where we're coming from. And I mentioned to him, have patient capital. Don't look at this as a, a, a transaction, because if you do it that way, you, you, you're gonna get it, you're gonna get frustrated because the trust has to be built. The relationship is, needs to be there, the first and foremost, in front of your mind, of creating a long-lasting relationship that will perhaps translate into friendships with grandchildren that we leave behind, right? And a community, we can't do it alone as indigenous peoples, <clears throat> remotely in particular, as Dallas pointed out earlier. You know, I think of what you talked about, about the child breaking their ankle. We had one of the legislative members have a heart attack. It took him 15 hours to get to the hospital. You know, and he's lucky to be alive today. But if not for the partners along the way to, who connected to one another, he probably wouldn't have. But the point is that the relationships are, they should be deeper than the transaction. Long lasting generational, intergenerational relationships. Think of it that way. And, and you'll have a lot of success. And, and I saw the presentation with Western and Nanwakwis Nation, Council Member Nations. That's obviously uh, a, a strong relationship despite those you know, ebbs and flows of the relation, the, what happens, right? The frustrations and being able to, and the other thing is to have difficult conversations. Mm. To have be respectful with one another, enough of one another to have those difficult conversations. My philosophy is be hard on the issues, soft on the people. What are the issues? Let's deal with those. Let's get through those together. Let's have those conversations and be honest and upfront and, and, and have meaning behind what your intentions are. Thank you. Great points. Um, you know, I think 
it's a little bit of a different day and age now for, I'm looking at the second question about how can businesses support capacity growth. It's a bit of a different age now because communities have land use plans, they have community plans, a lot of them are available online now. And when we first started doing some of these discussions, you know, while we might have known as a community where we wanted to get, we hadn't articulated that to the rest of the world much. And I think that's something that I'm seeing start to close the gap on making sure these discussions at least start off on the right foot, is a company can go do a little bit of research. If they don't, it's almost a bit of a clear understanding that they're looking for a transactional relationship. And so there's a lot of data out there. I mean, I'm not one of those people who say believe everything you read on the internet, but most of these nations have you know, good up-to-date websites that talk about their community visions and plans. But, um, you know, Kevin, as, as I've talked about, you've kind of, you know, started politically and you keep going. You know, what's one thing you've seen on how businesses can incorporate Indigenous perspectives and knowledge? I know people used to be so afraid of it. I would have an engineer or someone come in and say, wow, we did this plan and this is the only way we can do it. And I'll use aquaculture as an example. Most of the siting of the first few aquaculture farms were so piss poorly done because we hadn't had that engagement where we said, wow, this makes sense because it has better water flow, or this makes sense because it's away from a certain beach that's important to us. But what have you seen taking the knowledge that you've gained from your elders and the people around you that you've been able to help the business world understand a little bit? Or the world outside of your community. I don't mean the business world, but the world outside your community. Yeah, a lot of it is, you know, it's it's about the uh, communication. It's about being able to um, first, establish a relationship. You got to be able to establish the relationship before you can do anything. You know that should be first and foremost within the within any kind of business opportunity that you see. Your project development is developing that relationship with the nation and understanding understanding the the capacity. You know what 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 can we work on or what what needs to be worked on or what how can we help? You know it's like uh, Gary alluded to. It's about that that relationship process. Of, of just reaching out and being, not just telling us what you're gonna do, but you know, you know, um, asking questions, you know, f about feasibility studies, about studies that were, what, what was this like land used for? What, is there any, any kind of like uh, traditional aspects to this land? Was this like, and maybe it, it was a past reserve, maybe it was a past um, eating area. You know, it's all about, um, Finding those and and creating those relationships because it's 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 different when you're just going in there just to get a profit. It's it's not it's not the same. It's yeah, um, like you know, it's it's about understanding the people and also having them in the process of being being part of it. You know, where can you see our people fitting in with these within within your capacity? How can we? How can our people be there to you know? You know, if, if you need people to speak on what what aspects of the land this is, or what aspects of even if it when it comes down to art, when it comes down to to anything, any anything that involves our community, how can we be a part of that conversation to to uh, to keep it going? You know, this is again one of those ones. Being someone who represents rural communities, I would love to give more time for this, but we do have a full agenda, but I just wanna thank the three of you for just providing some much needed insight. There's no one way to do economic development, but I think through discussions like this, I'm gonna steal that one from you, Gary. Be hard on the issue, but soft on the people. Let's have those tough discussions, and let's continue to do that going forward. So I'd like to thank the panel for their work today, and Logan's gonna take over for a second. Okay, well, these guys take a quick photo. Um, we're gonna jump into a 30 minute networking break now, so we encourage you all to head out into the trade show, and thank you very much to our networking break sponsor, Fortis BC, for making that possible. Uh, thank you all so much for sticking around this afternoon. Just a final reminder, please visit the Fur Canada silent auction. Uh, all of those proceeds are going to uh, Fur Canada's education program and the Native Women's Association of Canada. Thank you so much, everybody.